Oki Niabskapi Pekani Nidan Negoshishkanapi. My Indian name is Prized Woman. My English name is Bree Blackworth. I'm an enrolled member of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, and I'm an associate in the Native American Practice Group at Kilpatrick Townsend. Thank you for participating in Kilpatrick Townsend's Native American Heritage Month. I'd like to thank the firm for its service to our tribal clients, its commitment to protecting and advancing the rights of indigenous people, and for giving me the opportunity to share my Native American heritage with all of you. I'll be talking about one of my favorite activities, powwow dancing. I'll first explain what a powwow is, and then my particular dance style and the regalia that you see in the videos. Powwows are best described as social gatherings of Native American people to dance, sing, socialize, as well as sell food, artwork, and other crafts. Powwows are more contemporary practiced in Indian country, uh, originating in the late 19th century. Native people from many different tribes across the nation participate in powwows, and it is an almost universal practice among tribes today. Powwows can last from one to three days, take place outdoors during the summer months and indoors during the winter months. You'll see several different types of dance styles among men and women at powwows. For the men, there is the traditional grass and fancy dance styles. For women, the, there are the traditional jingle and fancy dance styles. A powwow dancing session opens up with the grand entry which is where all of the dancers enter the dancing arena. Everyone in the audience is required to stand during grand entry to honor the flags, veterans, and elders that lead the grand entry procession. The flags that lead in powwows are usually carried by veterans and include the United States flag, the prisoner of war flag, the Canadian flag for our First Nations peoples, uh, a tribal flag, and an eagle staff. The flag bearers are followed by all of the veterans, the head man and woman dancers, power royalty, who are then followed by the remainder of the participating dancers, headed by the golden age, adults, teens, junior, and tiny tot dancers, which are organized by specific dance category. After all the dancers have entered the dance floor, the host drum usually sings a flag song to honor the flags and the veterans, and then a victory song. After these two songs are sung, a prayer is then usually offered by a tribal elder, which is followed by the introduction of the veterans, power royalty, head man and woman dancers. Intertribal and round dances uh, then kick off the remainder of the dancing, and during intertribals and round dances, everybody attending the powwow can come onto the floor and participate. Uh, regardless of whether you're native and regardless of uh, whether you're in traditional regalia or not. The remainder of the powwow often includes specific dance categories, um, which are sometimes competition dances. There are also memorials for our community members who've passed on, honor songs, coming out and naming ceremonies, as well as outgoing royalty and head dancer specials sponsored by individuals, families, and organizations. The dance style I dance is called the Women's Northern Traditional Dance Style, and there are several regional variations of this dance style. This dance is the oldest of the women's powwow dance styles, and it involves a slow moving bouncing step that corresponds to the beat of the drum. The steps of this dance are supposed to be modest and elegant, and as with all powwow dance styles, you're supposed to stop dancing exactly on the beat that the drumming does. You'll see two specific Northern women's Northern traditional dance styles in the video. Uh, one of them is called a straight dance uh, where I dance forward around the floor. And the second dance style is called a round dance. And this is where I dance uh, sideways in a counterclockwise direction. And you will notice the drum beat in the two videos is different. When you go to dance, you know what kind of song and what type of dance is called for once you hear the beat of the drum. I sewed the red ribbon dress that you see in the videos in memory of and to bring awareness to missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. 
Red ribbon skirts and dresses have become a symbol of solidarity and call to action across Indian country for the thousands of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in this nation. The cotton cloth has a floral design on it, which to the Blackfeet or Abscapi Pekani people symbolizes medicine and healing. So when I dance in this dress, I pray to Creator to bring healing to Indian country and to the families of our missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. My moccasins, belt, back purse, and leggings are fully beaded on smoked elk hide and depict a traditional floral design. My parents traded their art for this beadwork while on a trip to Montana years ago. I beaded the barrette on the back of my head, the hair ties, long necklace, and the purse in my right hand to match the rest of my beadwork. I am wearing two immature golden eagle feathers on the back of my head. Two feathers symbolizes that I am married. The distinctive black and white tail feathers on the back of my head are the most coveted of eagle feathers and can only be harvested from immature golden eagles. Although eagles are protected under federal law and the unsanctioned harvest of eagles is a federal crime, enrolled tribal members can legally obtain eagle feathers through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. On top of my head is what is called an eagle fluff or plume. These feathers come from underneath the eagle's tail, and I beaded the stem connecting the eagle fluff uh, to my head, and my father, Terrence Gardepi, uh, made the fluff itself. My fan is also made of eagle tail feathers and is over a half century old. I am wearing a cape made from detallium shells. My mother, Catherine Blackhorse, made this cape and it won prestigious awards at the Santa Fe Indian Art Market, the Heard Museum Guild Indian Art Market, and the Jean Autry Museum Indian Arts Marketplace. She also made the detallium hair tie drops, choker necklace, and breastplate. These detallium shells need to each be individually cut and filed so that they are the same size before being placed on a cape, breastplate, or necklace. And on this cape, there are hundreds of individual detallium shells. Now, detallium shells are a kind of seashell, specifically the shell of a tubular mollusk. These shells, at and before treaty times, were harvested from deep waters around the Pacific Northwest coast and were a coveted item among Northwest Coast Salish tribes, tribes in California, and Plains Indian tribes. Detallium shells were even used as a form of currency in some places. Among Plains Indians, detallium shells were traditionally associated with wealth and were used in women's regalia. I am wearing two ivory bull elk teeth as earrings. Ivory elk teeth traditionally symbolized wealth as well and that you came from a family of good providers because elk only have two ivory eye teeth each. I am also wearing river otter hair ties and carry a full river otter pelt in place of a shawl on my left arm. Uh, River otter hides were also highly coveted traditionally because of the quality and beauty of their fur. For those of you who live in the Seattle area, there are in non-COVID times lots of powwows in the area, and they are generally open to the public and anyone can attend. Specifically, United Indians of All Tribes Foundation hosts its annual Daybreak Star Powwow at Discovery Park in the Magnolia neighborhood the third weekend in July, and that's a great powwow for first-timers and an excellent family activity. I'll be there in July 2022, fingers crossed and COVID permitting for those of you from the Seattle office who want to check it out and even for those of you who want to jump on the dance floor. So thank you again for the opportunity to share my powwow dancing and Native American heritage. Okay.